How important is the relationship you had with your mother, especially when you were very young? Some psychologists suggest that this very important relationship can explain criminal behaviour. Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're going to explore psychodynamic explanations of criminal behaviour, which build on Sigmund Freud's ideas of the unconscious mind. This is going to include an exploration of firstly, the inadequate superego, and then secondly, Bowlby's maternal deprivation theory. Blackburn's theory of the inadequate superego is rooted in psychodynamic theory, particularly drawing on Freud's tripartite structure of the personality, the id, the ego and the superego. According to Freud, the superego, known as the morality principle, is responsible for enforcing moral standards and societal rules. It functions as a kind of internalised conscience that helps regulate impulses from the id, the pleasure principle, and guides the ego, the reality principle, to behave in morally acceptable ways. Blackburn built on this idea to explain how criminal behaviour might result from an inadequately developed superego. If you need a refresher on Freud's ideas and the structure of personality, you can find a video on that in the description below. The key to understanding how Blackburn's theory links to criminal behaviour lies in the imbalance between the id, your impulses and desires, and the superego, your moral standards. According to Blackburn, there are three main types of inadequate superego that can lead to criminal behaviour. In each of these three, the ego is unable to properly manage the competing demands of the id and superego. Number one, the weak superego. A weak superego arises when an individual's moral development is incomplete. This typically occurs due to poor parental relationships during childhood, where the child fails to internalise the moral standards of their parents. According to psychodynamic theory, a child internalises the characteristics and moral values of their same-sex parent when they identify with them during the phallic stage. However, if for example a boy is raised by a single mother, the boy has no father figure to identify with, and so would not internalise a set of moral characteristics, and so would have a weak superego. Without a fully formed superego, the individual may lack sufficient guilt, shame or anxiety when they consider breaking rules or committing antisocial acts. As a result of this weak superego, their behaviour may be guided primarily by the desires of the id, the impulsive, pleasure-seeking urges, with little restraint from an internalised moral code. Number two, the deviant superego. A deviant superego develops when the child internalises a moral code that is at odds with societal norms. This can happen if a child is raised in an environment where their same-sex parent, their role model, is a criminal themselves. If they identify with these individuals, they will internalise their criminal moral values. As a result, the child's superego encourages criminal behaviours, leading them to believe that illegal or immoral actions are justified or even desirable. The overharsh superego occurs when an individual's conscience is excessively critical. In such cases, the superego imposes unrealistic or overly rigid standards on the individual, causing overwhelming feelings of guilt and shame for minor transgressions. In other words, their conscience is so bothered that to relieve it, they want to be punished but need to commit a criminal act to receive punishment. The inadequate superego explanation for criminality has been criticised for its lack of falsifiability. This is the idea that in order for a theory to be scientific, it has to have the possibility of being shown to be false or being shown to be incorrect. Science doesn't try to go around trying to simply find evidence for theories, but to try to find evidence that disproves the theories. Psychodynamic explanations of behaviour focus on the role of the unconscious mind, which is something that cannot be directly observed and is based on subjective interpretation. There is no way to falsify and disprove the theories. As a result, Blackburn's theory of the inadequate superego as an explanation of offending is questionable because it's hard to validate 
validate through experimental research. Another way his theory has been criticised is because of its overemphasis on childhood and parental influence. This is because Blackburn's theory, like much of psychodynamic theory, places a strong emphasis on childhood and parental relationships as factors that cause criminal behaviour. While early experiences are undoubtedly important, this explanation tends to downplay the role of other environmental factors that can influence criminality. For example, so Sutherland proposed the differential association theory, which suggests that the people we hang around with, such as our peers, and the attitudes they have towards criminal behaviour can have a tremendous influence over criminal behaviour. As an extra point of evaluation, psychodynamic explanations of crime can be criticised for being gender biased. For a more in-depth explanation of that, you can check the video on gender biased linked in the description below. The second psychodynamic theory of crime relates to Bowlby's maternal deprivation theory, which you may remember from the attachment topic. But you may be wondering why this comes under the psychodynamic explanations. Well, more on that in just a minute. But first, what does Bowlby's theory state and how does it relate to criminal behaviour? Well, Bowlby suggested that a strong, continuous attachment between a mother and her child is essential for the child's development. Key to his theory is the critical period. Bowlby believed that a child needs a strong, continuous attachment to a caregiver during the first two and a half years of life. However, if the child experiences prolonged separation from their caregiver during this critical period, it could lead to permanent psychological consequences. Bowlby suggested a number of consequences, but for the purposes of this video on criminal behaviour, he argued that children who experience maternal deprivation are more likely to suffer from affectionless psychopathy a condition where individuals show a lack of empathy or concern for others, making them more prone to engage in criminal or antisocial behaviour, and delinquency. Bowlby's research suggested that prolonged separation from a caregiver could lead to increased risk of delinquency and criminal behaviour later in life. For a more in-depth exploration of Bowlby's ideas, including his monotropic theory and his maternal deprivation theory, you can find links to those videos in the description below. So why does Bowlby's theory come under the psychodynamic explanations? Well, here are two reasons. Number one, the importance of early childhood. Freud's theory of psychosexual development emphasised that early childhood experiences, particularly with parents, shape the development of the personality in the future. Bowlby adopted this view, arguing that early relationships, especially the attachment with their mother, play a crucial role in shaping a child's emotional well-being and later behaviour. Number two, the role of the unconscious. Freud believed that unresolved conflicts and traumas from childhood could lead to unconscious drives that show themselves later in life. Similarly, Bowlby argued that early disruptions in attachment can lead to long-term emotional disturbances that show themselves as criminal or antisocial behaviour. Evidence for Bowlby's maternal deprivation theory comes from his famous 44 Thieves study. He examined 44 juvenile delinquents who had a history of stealing and compared them to a control group of 44 non-delinquent children. Bowlby found that 14 of these children were diagnosed as affectionless psychopaths, characterised by a lack of guilt, empathy or concern for others. Importantly, 12 of these 14 children had experienced prolonged separation during the critical period period. This demonstrated the connection between maternal deprivation and criminal behaviour. However, there is evidence that challenges the findings from the 44 Thieves study and Bowlby's theory. Hilda Lewis in 1954 partially replicated Bowlby's study, but instead of 88 children, there were 500 young people. These children were admitted to the Mersham Reception Centre, which was basically a centre for what they called delinquent, maladjusted, homeless or neglected children. What they found was that when they looked at the history of early prolonged separation for a child from their mother, what Bowlby called deprivation, it did not predict criminal behaviour. In other words, there did not seem to be a relationship between maternal deprivation and the consequences that Bowlby suggested like criminal behaviour. 
Finally, one of the main ways that both the inadequate superego and Bowlby's maternal deprivation theory can be criticised relates to determinism. This is because they see the cause of criminal behaviour as something unconscious. This is referred to as psychic determinism, where unconscious forces are the driving cause behind behaviour. One of the problems with arguing that unconscious forces are the cause is that it can lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy, where they behave in line with what they understand happened to them as a child and go on to commit crimes because they believe that's just who they are now. They might learn about how they were brought up as a child, separated from their mother, and believe that their behaviour is now inevitable. Furthermore, if the cause is something unconscious, then by definition we're not aware of this. And if we're not aware of it, this could lead some to argue that we cannot be held responsible for our actions because we lack free will. This could lead some people not to take responsibility for their behaviour and perhaps instead blame their parents. However, this overly deterministic view is at odds with the justice system and society's understanding of responsibility and free will, where we are held accountable for our actions. Now that we've explored various explanations of crime, it's time to consider how to deal with offenders once they've been caught. And this brings us to prisons. How effective are they? And can they change someone so that when they are finally let out, they leave their previous life of crime? To watch that video, you can click the video on the screen now or link below and for more resources related to psychology check out the Bear It In Mind website. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.